Hi. I'm going to talk about flash memory. A lot of you have used flash, but um, I believe that anybody who works with computers should have a proper understanding of how, how they work. Kind of, this is a transistor. This is how we make logic gates from it and building up into bigger and bigger sort of black boxes. Um, so I'm going to do that with flash to a certain extent. Um, I'm going to talk about what, is, what flash is, how it works, how we put it together. Um, and then I'm going to talk about why it's special, what we have to do to cope with the characteristics of Flash when we are trying to reliably store data on it. Um, I'm going to talk about the methods we use to store data on Flash, the translation layers, which are um, the common method you'll, use in, um, you'll see used in consumer devices to make Flash look as if it is a hard disk and other potential approaches like file systems directly on the Flash media. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the software we have in Linux, the drivers for supporting Flash directly. So this is a transistor. Well, kind of. Um, so basic field effect transistor, you put a voltage on the control gate here, and it, I'm not going to go into the quantum mechanics. Um, but basically, it screws with the electrical field and allows the electrons to pass between the other two gates. So you put a voltage on here, and it allows current to pass. What's different in a flash cell is we have this floating gate here, an island with you know, insulation around it, and you pump electrons into that. Um, and when there are electrons in it, they screw with the field some more, so you have to put a higher voltage on the gate in order to allow current to pass. So basically, when the cell is programmed, it has electrons in the gate, the, the floating gate there, and you can tell whether it's programmed or not by looking at the voltage you have to put on the control before the current will pass between the, the source and the drain. So that is basically a single flash cell, a single bit. Um, originally, we would wire this up in an arrangement similar to this, nor flash. Um, so for the, the bit line that you read out, or that you program, um, any individual cell would pull that down to ground and you would see the difference. Um, and this is kind of the physical representation of, of how that would um, be used. Um, nor flash chips would work very much like ROM electrically. They were, um, you could read them directly. Um, just address and data lines. Um, and you could program individual bits, basically, until all the bits are cleared. Um, the way we wire, the way we arrange flash chips, flash cells in a chip, is such that you can individually program bits. Um, and that's done by, here we get into the quantum mechanics again. Um, you put a, a high voltage on the gate and a high current through between the other two terminals, and that causes electrons to tunnel into the, um, the floating gate. Um, and the way you clear it, this is normally done only in large blocks, sort of 64, 128 kilobyte blocks. Um, you put a high voltage on the other one of the other terminals. Don't ask me too much about the quantum mechanics. I'm going to move on from that very quickly. Um, but basically, you can set the individual bits, but you can only clear the bits, and that's back from a logical 0 to a 1 in large chunks, so you know, typically 128 kilobytes of data. Um, it's a bit like an Etch-a-Sketch in that sense. Everybody familiar with the Etch-a-Sketch? You can draw on it until it's all black, and then the only thing you can do is wipe the entire thing. Uh, so that's how a flash erase block works. Um, the NOR flash arrangement was very useful, and we use it for BIOS and things you have to boot from. Um, but it's not very um, space efficient. Um, and so later we came up with the NAND flash arrangement, where in order to read the contents of any particular cell that you're interested in, you have to ha put a sufficiently high voltage on all the other cells so that they will pass current. And then you can put the sort of intermediate voltage on here, so it may or may not, depending on whether it's programmed. And so that allows you to get a much denser arrangement of, uh, nan of flash cells in the chip. We call that a string of 
of NAND flash. And we arrange it into erase blocks and divide those in, into individual pages. So a typical erase block will have 2K of data, and in order to allow us to do error correction, we'll add a bit more on, on the end, so typically 2112 bytes of data in an erase block, almost 17,000 bits in a, sorry, that, that's in a, in a page. Um, and so we read a whole page out into, the, into a, a RAM buffer inside the chip at a time um, by selecting all those cells. Um, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about the problems with losing data from flash. Um, one of the problems is that the electrons are, that are programmed into the floating gate there, well, they just bugger off. Electrons are like that. Um, and so over time, you will simply lose data. You will see bit flips just naturally happening. Um, with repeated programming and er especially erase cycles, you will also find that the insulating material breaks down, charge builds up in it, and that actually is what contributes to the limited lifetime of flash chips. You've heard that you know, certain flash chips may have a million erase cycles. These days it's going down by orders of magnitude, so we're talking about 100,000 erase cycles per erase block before it's just useless and you can't use it anymore. 10,000 in some of the latest chips. And that's because of the charge buildup in the substrate, which causes you know, leakage to be so fast that it, it's, it's useless. And the other two ways that data get lost on flash chips, I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail the diagrams, are read disturb and write disturb. So read disturb is basically the act of reading the flash will tend to degrade the contents. And write disturb will not only write to the cells that you're actually intending to write to, but they will also tend to cause bit flips in adjacent cells. So here's a, as an example of programming a NAND flash. So you put a high voltage across, so, so there's 20 volts across. The, the numbers are mostly made up, but for example, there's um, a 20 volt um, potential difference on, across the um, control gate there of this particular cell and this one, the ones that we're trying to program. So this down here is a page, and these bits we're leaving at one, their natural erased state as we program this page, and these bits are being set to zero. Um, so these bits will be programmed, but come on. You will see that there is also a potential difference, a smaller one, across various other cells. And these cells have some probability of um, losing data, of you know, seeing bit flips as we program the, the cells around them. So that's something like probability of 1 in 10 to the 10 for, um, for SLC flash chips, single uh, level cell, and maybe 100 times more than that, 1 in 10 to the 8 for MLC. I'll talk a little bit about SLC and MLC in a moment. Um, so read disturb, it's a very similar principle. We are reading this page. Um, and we are actually putting a um, potential across the other cells and tending to cause disturbance in those cells. So basically, we lose a lot of data just by programming and reading the flash. Um, what makes it even more fun is that these days we are trying to put multiple bits of information into a single cell. So what I've talked about so far has been, you know, either there are electrons pumped into this floating gate or not. Um, and that's, you know, if a, vault, if a um, cell is not programmed and it's left at a 1, then the voltage needed to make current pass may be somewhere in this range. And if it has been programmed to a zero, then the voltage will be higher. And so you, you work out um, whether it's programmed just by looking at the voltage which is necessary in order to make the, the transistor pass current. 
In a multi-level cell, you actually try and derive more than one bit of information from that, but according to how much, you know, how many electrons, how much charge you have pumped into the floating gate, um, which obviously makes it much more error-prone. So in MLC cells, you will see much more, many more bit flips, um, much more data loss. We tend to use more ECC. I mentioned earlier that, for example, in a 2K page um, flash, you'll have 64 bytes of out-of-band extra data per page. That's mostly for ECC. In the days of SLC flash chips, you could put some ECC there, but you could use more of the spare area for metadata and other interesting things. With MLC chips, generally, because they haven't actually increased the amount of spare area, you have to use all of the spare area for your, um, for your ECC syndrome, and you cannot use any of it for metadata. Um, so that's the, the internals of the flash chip. Um, the way it's presented to the host, generally, um, is with a, a fairly uniform interface. Um, there's a little controller and RAM buffer inside, so you read and write pages you know, to this RAM buffer by sequencing them, them in on the data bus. Um, and you can also send a command, such as, you know, by um, using the command latch enable, um, line, you can send a, a byte of a command, which will be an arrays or program or read page into the buffer or sequence data out the, the data bus. And also, obviously, some commands actually have addresses attached. And so um, that's the standard interface for um, NAND flash chips. Once upon a time, we would just hook this up to some GPIO lines. It didn't really matter how fast it went. Uh, you could even do it off a PC parallel port. Um, but obviously more and more these days people care a little bit more about speed. We're not just seeing them in, you know, slow and better devices. And so we have decent controllers which will do this with DMA to host RAM and even do error correction in, well, they will at least generate the ECC data on write automatically and will check it on read. A lot of them will simply flag an error when they read a whole page and let you deal with the fixing of ECC errors in software. Um, so these are the things we have to think about when coping with flash. I mentioned error correction. We have to cope with the fact that there will be bit flips. And these may happen randomly. We will, even if there are pages that we never really care about, it's a bootloader on a machine that only gets booted once a year, you do have to go back and read those static pages periodically at runtime before you have to reboot um, so that you can notice a bit flip and perhaps read the page, correct the errors while there are still few enough to be corrected, write out the data elsewhere. Um, we have to cope with bad blocks. Some blocks go bad, some blocks are marked as bad as they leave the factory and you must never use those blocks, you must never try to erase them because the world may end if you do so, according to the data sheets. Um, so we have to handle bad block management, and we also um, have to handle wear leveling. Um, not going through the slide in order, um, but that's good because you shouldn't just read your slides, should you? Um, so we also have to handle wear leveling because over time the um, the cells break down and so start to become unusable. What you don't want to do is wear out, for example, if you're using a fat file system on top of a flash translation layer, you do not want to wear out the arrays blocks that you tend to use for your fat long before the rest of the device and thus render it unusable when it didn't need to be. You want to wear out the um, flash relatively evenly so that you can extend the lifetime as much as possible. Um, one of the things that's come into play in recent NAND flash chips, well, at least in the last five years rather than ten, um, is that you must program the pages sequentially. So within an arrays block, um, you must program the first page first and then the second, etc. And this is to reduce the amount of program disturb, because if you were to write blocks in a random order, you would tend to cause more bit flips in the surrounding 
surrounding blocks. So the data sheets now say that you, you should start at the beginning and work towards the end. Garbage collection, um, this comes about because of the, the etch-a-sketch nature of the erase block. Um, what will happen is you've filled up a, uh, a block with data, some of which are still valid and useful, but some data belongs to deleted files or something else and is no longer relevant. Um, but once your whole, the whole of your flash, or hopefully slightly before the whole of your flash has been written, you've got to start thinking about making space for new writes. So what you need to do is consolidate the still valid data from these part valid, part invalid erase blocks into new erase blocks. So what you do is you copy the bits that you still want and then erase the, the victim erase block um, so that you've gained space. And the, the most fun we have is with MLC Flash. I mentioned that you have two bits, or you know, sometimes more, we're talking about three bits per page. I think even four bits per page now, sorry, per cell. Um, they don't put those bits in the same page so that you read and write them at the same time. That would be too easy. The reason they don't do that is because um, basically you have to program the, you have to pump enough electrons into the floating gate um, to get all the way from a zero to the, the three level in certain cases if you're programming two zeros into the two, the, into the pair of bits. Um, and that will either be slow if you have to go all the way to a three, if you have to pump three handfuls of electrons in, or you have to pump it harder, in which case you cause more program disturb. So what we do is we put the separate bits of information in the, in the multi-level cell in separate logical pages, so that when you're programming the first, you only have to pump two handfuls of electrons in, or none, as the case may be. And then when you're programming the second, you pump, pump one or zero for the, the least significant bit. Which leads to great fun because when you program your first page, you might think, yay, my data are committed to the medium, everything is happy, I can return OK from my F-Sync call, etc. But when you later come back and program the other page of that pair, if you get power failure, something goes wrong when you're programming that page, you can lose the information that was in the first logical page. And just to make it even more fun, because we love working around hardware, in our software, um, they don't even make them adjacent pages. Often it's page zero and three or something else, and they don't always tell you which pages they are either. Um, so yeah, MLC Flash, not my favorite thing. Um, so that's, yeah, those are the problems we have to deal with. Um, there are two major ways we present Flash in the way that um, we can actually store files on it. The first is you try and make it pretend to be spinning Rust. Um, this was really useful in the days of DOS where we had to provide an int13 disk BIOS handler and that was the only way to do it. We couldn't really sensibly do installable file systems, although we could eventually. Um, and it also makes a certain amount of sense because you can then just put it in a black box and stick it on an IDE bus, SCSI bus. There are some advantages to this approach. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how a flash translation layer works. It is basically a file system. It's a file system that kind of presents one file, which gets random access to individual 512-byte sectors within that file. Um, so this is an old example of a flash translation layer. It does violate the rule I mentioned earlier that these days you mustn't write pages out of order, but it's an example of, of how it might work. So you it would have, um, it would also be on SLC Flash and it would um, be able to use um, metadata in the, the spare area of the Flash. So it would, um, it would be able to mark um, each sector with the sector number that it actually represented. Um, the logical disk was divided up into erase block size chunks, virtual erase blocks and each virtual erase block of the disk was represented by a number of physical erase blocks. And so I'm just going to consider one chunk, the, you know, the first, the first, say, 
128K of the disk. Um, so imagine the first two sectors, the boot block, um, have been written, um, and that's it. Very, very, very simple. So the, the data have been written, and we've got the little metadata in the spare area saying, you know, this is sector one, this is sector two. Um, and then um, they are overwritten, and um, sectors one, two, three, and four are all written. And what we do is we make a chain of erase blocks. So both of these physical erase blocks represent the same um, virtual, er virtual erase block. The contents of sectors one and two, they can't be overwritten in the original block, so they have to be written into a new block in the chain. Whereas sectors three and four can be written into the original physical erase block. And then, you know, we'll write some more sectors, two, four, and six. We'll have to introduce a new block into the chain for sector two, whereas the others can be written in the existing physical erase blocks. Eventually, you kind of run out of erase blocks. You have to start consolidating. And so what we do is we copy all the, um, all the data from the old erase blocks into the final one in the chain. And then we can start erasing the old box in the chain. So that's you know, a very simple way that a flash translation layer might work and might use the flash in order to present a disk interface. Um, one of the big inefficiencies in this model is the fact that some of these sectors might not be used. It's pretending to be a disk. You could have filled up your file system, your FAT file system, XT2, whatever, that's on that disk, and then deleted all the files. But the disk has absolutely no idea that you've done so. So um, you've probably heard about the trim command that's been added recently for discard sectors where we can actually tell the, the block device, actually, I don't care about the contents of this particular sector anymore. So you can just forget about them. Um, so if we go back to the previous slide where, you know, before the erase blocks the chain were, before the erase block chain was um, consolidated, um, we could say, um, trim, I don't care about sectors one and three anymore, just forget about them. And so when the, um, the chain is folded, they're just gone. They don't get copied into the last block, and so if they are subsequently overwritten, they, are, they can go straight into that block. You've saved a whole physical erase block, you know, a whole erase on a physical erase block, and it means that a lot less data have to be copied around when you're garbage collecting. Um, but that's just one example of flash translation layer, quite an old one. Another one might be more log structured. So the first write, um, just has those two sectors, and then the next four sectors are written just physically contiguously. Obviously, there's more work to be done here to keep track of where each sector can be found on the flash when you, uh, when you start up. But that's something that's handled by the file system that is either inside the, the black box, which is an SSD, a compact flash card, an SD card, or you can do it in software. We have about six implementations of these translation layers in software in the kernel at the moment. Um, so basically, what you have here is a file system on top of another file system. Um, there are a number of problems with this. I mean, yes, it's nice and simple, and it you know, makes it nice and easy to provide a black box interface, but it's not massively efficient. It's very hard to optimize um, in both directions. The upper level file system, the ButterFS, XT4, whatever, finds it very hard to optimize for how the underlying file system, the translation layer, will work. So we've seen certain characteristics from old-style SSDs that we've tried to work around and cope with and you know, try and align our writes to the erase block and tweak our partitioning so that writes are aligned to the underlying erase blocks. And we've tried to do this in file systems, and then found that the next generation of the, file, of, the, um, of the SSDs just doesn't need this anymore, and, or in fact that it's counterproductive, because we are trying to optimize for this opaque layer underneath. And likewise, the, the, layer, the file system underneath cannot sensibly optimize for the file system that's going to be used on top of it. 
it doesn't know what kind of file system is going to be used on top of it. We have seen some fun things with this, though. We've seen compact flashcards, which will assume that they're going to have fat used on them. And this predates trim. But they thought, this trim thing, that would be really cool. It would be nice if we could know when certain sectors weren't used. But hey, look, when they write to this block, that's going to be the fat. So we can see when they've cleared this cluster and said that it's unused, and then we can discard the contents of those sectors over there. How cool is that? That's lovely if you're running fat on it. Not so lovely if you're running anything else. So yeah, there are problems with the layering approach of one file system on top of another. Another is garbage collection. When we have to do the block folding or the um, you know, other kinds of garbage collection, or just where level, if we see a bit flip and we decide that contents of one physical arrays block need to be written out elsewhere, that is an ideal time for the upper layer file system to defragment or otherwise optimize its data. If it's an extent-based file system, it could then um, reorganize that data as it's being copied. Um, but if you have the layering there and you don't let the upper file system see that, then you miss the opportunity to optimize the data storage as you're moving it about anyway. Um, one of the other things we really care about with garbage collection is we want to separate long-term data that's just going to sit there forever, like your kernel for most normal people who don't change their kernel every day. Um, that's just going to sit there. What you don't want it to do is live in the same block with the A time of libc. Because what you want to do is keep long-term data together in blocks that don't get changed very often and short-term data together so that when you um, pick a block for garbage collection, it's actually mostly stuff that doesn't matter anyway. And you don't have much copying to do in order to do garbage collection. And again, the real file system can have some clue about how long individual blocks are going to last. Um, but the layering doesn't really offer you that. And likewise, transactions. Um, the lower level f file system, the translation layer, has to provide um, guarantees about you know, what will happen in, term, you know, in face of power failure, etc just as the upper la layer file system has to provide the same, well, very similar um, atomicity guarantees. And it, it can be very efficient to, do, to have both of those. But actually, it's not so inefficient because mostly the um, flash translation layers don't get that right anyway. If you do any power fail testing on most SSD type devices, you'll just find that they crap themselves. Um, and they can't actually mount their own internal file system. And so the whole thing goes south. You've basically got a little brick. Um, and that's a problem, because you don't actually have any access. If it's a black box you know, separate device, like a compact flashcard, you don't have any access to the underlying medium to do any kind of file system check on it or recovery. Um, so you're just kind of screwed, really. So we, you know, we, we reckon it takes maybe five years for a file system to come to maturity, ButterFS. So how many years before people will really start trusting ButterFS for their mail spool? Who's already doing so? <laughs> You're mad. <laughs> um, you know, who will think about doing so in a year's time? Two years? Three years? Yeah. So we reckon it takes a number of years for a file system to really come to maturity. And they were talking about an open source file system where we can poke at it, diagnose it, debug it, um, and look at what it's doing on, on the underlying medium. Now put that in a black box, have it written by the same crack-smoking hobos they drag in off the street to write PC biases. <laughs> who, wa <laughs> who wants to trust their mail store to that? Right. So there is no fundamental reason why this should be broken. There are some efficiency concerns about the pretend to be spinning rust approach, which are mostly, the, the biggest one of those is trim. Um, and once trim is actually implemented sensibly, um, that will deal with the biggest efficiency concern. In fact, trim is mostly implemented quite badly at the moment. It's supposed to make things go faster, but it's so slow that the current implementations, I think ButterFS has it disabled by default, um, even on devices which claim to support it. But yeah, the efficiency concerns are there. The reliability, that is not a fundamental issue. 
It should not be like that. It's just that in practice, it always has been a problem. So um, the other approach is to have a file system directly on the flash. Now, I've actually spoken in Brisbane at LCA on the JFS2 flash file system a number of years ago. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. But I'll talk a little bit about the support we have in Linux for um, dealing with flash directly. So the, the support we have at the moment is showing its age a little bit. We have synchronous read and write APIs because in the old days it was all bit banging and nobody really cared about you know, DMA and queuing. We need to fix that. We're working on a new API that looks a bit more like the block API in that you just queue up a whole bunch of things you want it to do and it tells you when it's done. Um, it did have an asynchronous arrays because that, that could take seconds um, back then. It handles the error, error correction and has various um, methods for dealing with different types of software and hardware ECC. And it handles bad, bad block management. So one of the things you'll find in NAND Flash is that one of the bytes or some of the bytes in the spare area will be zeroed when you get a virgin flash from the factory. And that's how bad blocks are marked. But we don't want to keep that as the way we mark, we remember bad blocks for you know, all the time that we're using the flash, partly because that involves going and looking at the spare area of every block, and partly because it means you can't use that byte, you know, byte three or whichever it is, for data, because if it ever actually got normally written with a zero, then that would suddenly look like a bad block next time, next time you scanned it. So what we do is we set aside a few erased blocks for redundancy, um, and we have a table, um, and when we take a virgin flash, we make a bad block table on the flash remembering which blocks are bad. And we can mark blocks bad later as, as they start to misbehave um, by updating that table on the flash. And so the, the MTD support in Linux provides all of this functionality um, for, for users of MTD devices to, um, to take advantage of. Um, and also, recent, a more recent development from IBM and Nokia is Ubi. Um, for unsorted block images, it's kind of like LVM on steroids for the flash interface. So it offers two main interfaces. It gives you static volumes, which you might use for a bootloader, finding your kernel. Um, they are atomically overwritable in much the same way as files on a POSIX file system, in that you write a new volume and then rename it over the top of your original one. So you write a new kernel and then rename it to kernel, and then um, you've got a safe method of of updating the, the kernel volume. Um, it does wear leveling on that and will um, and will do the scrubbing that's required to test for bit flips in, in data, as I mentioned we needed earlier. And then, uh, more, perhaps more interestingly, we have the dynamic volumes, which present, which do a certain amount of the underlying translation that, um, that flash translation layers do, but they don't force you into the whole, you know, atomically overwritable 512 byte sector thing. So it basically gives you a simple logical to physical mapping. So you deal with logical arrays blocks, and Ubi under the covers maps that onto a physical arrays block. And when you say I want to erase this logical arrays block, it only needs to unmap it. It doesn't, it doesn't have to erase it immediately. Erasers can be quite slow. It just has to say, okay, there is the physical arrays block. Um, associated with that logical block anymore. And we have um, UBFS, a file system written at Nokia, shipped on the N900, um, which makes use of this and provides a proper file system on top. Um, and I'm also looking, and I know I've been saying this for a while, but I will get some time to spend on this this year, honest, at ButterFS directly on the Ubi interface. So ButterFS also already has um, a fairly good abstraction for its underlying storage, which allows it to do RAID and other things internally. And it should be quite useful to do um, ButterFS on Ubi. ButterFS also already has the um, copy on write mechanism. It doesn't overwrite data in place. So I was going to talk briefly about my ideal hardware wish list, but somebody's holding up a cut sign at me. Um, so I'm going to go ignore him and carry on anyway. Um, <laughs> I want fast queued DMA transfers, so you know, not the bit banging, not even sort of synchronous function. I want full error correction in the hardware. I don't want to have to do the um, 
the retirement coding myself to cope, cope with errors, because they do happen often enough. It's not that much of a, a slow path that should never happen. I want scrubbing. I want to be able to tell the hardware, just read this page. Don't give me the data. Just tell me if the ECC works. And then I'll, co I'll cope if, you know, tell me, tell me if something goes wrong. Tell me if a bit flipped. And I want a page copy. A lot of flash chips have an internal copy command. So you can say, read the contents of this page, write it out there. This is completely pointless if you're not actually going to check and correct the ECC. So we can't really use that if we're being sane. So what I'd really like to see is some um, updated firmwares for some of the SSD devices, um, which give us this kind of interface, give us something very similar to the UBI interface that we can put a proper file system on efficiently. Um, and now, I think I have come to the end. So, do we have questions? Me, one from me first. I've heard um, s that uh, the wear leveling on some of these devices is pretty stupid, and some of the Linux devs would like it taken off um, by default from the developers of these devices. Comments? Yes. So, often you'll find that the wear leveling only happens within a certain chunk. So, you've got a sort of a few gigabytes of um, compact flash device, for example, and yet the wear leveling only happens within a certain sort of 64K chunk, no, probably a bit more than that, you know, a megabyte chunk. So if you put fat on it, for example, you will get wear leveling across the first megabyte of your compact flash device, but only across the first megabyte. So you will still wear that megabyte out much more quickly than the rest of the flash, and you it's very ineffective wear leveling. But again, you can't tell. We've seen some very silly things when we've actually taken these things apart and hooked up um, logic analyzers to see what they do on the flash. One particularly impressive one, when it was doing garbage collection, would read from the sector that was, you know, the victim block into RAM. Then it would copy, pick another victim block that needed garbage collecting, copy the valid data from there into the block this first victim block that it had just erased. Then it would erase the second victim block, and only then would it write back the valid data from RAM into the second victim. So it, it moved data around. It wasn't just, you know, doing... Um, it wouldn't end up just moving data from one block to another and wearing those blocks out. It, it's a kind of a valid technique for wear leveling, but perhaps you want to do it without quite such a huge race window for losing power and just losing data. Um, trim uh, marks a block as not needed anymore. Is there an untrim, or what happens? What happens after you try to read a trimmed block? Does that mark it as dirty again, or, or what happens? When you try to read a trimmed, why would you try to read a trimmed block? Yeah, um, that's. The st standards committees have said that the, the contents are undefined, I think, but they do want it to always receive, read, read the same data afterwards. So if you trim a block and read it once, it doesn't matter what you get back. You're not guaranteed n not to get the original data. Trim can do nothing. It's an optimization. It's not for secure delete. But if you, re if you trim and then you read some data, you might get all zeros, you might get the copying file, I don't care, it doesn't matter. But whatever you get the first time you read after trim, you shall get it the second time. It, it shouldn't just change randomly. That, that's the only thing that, that you can really get. No. Um, I'm not sure if you've come across it like there was recently a quite popular phone, Android phone that shipped with a file system that made it to be, well, it caused lag issues just because they picked one file type of file system to use for the internal flash storage versus another. Is it good ones to use, n ones you should never use? And never use JFFS2. <laughs> it is obsolete. Use something else instead. I would mostly say UBFS these days. Um, Android often use YAFS2. Um, there are issues with that. It's not upstream. Um, if you have the engineering, if you want to spend your time dealing with code that isn't upstream, then that's fine. But it's certainly not something I would normally recommend. Um, but yeah, UBFS I would normally suggest. And once I've pulled my finger out, ButterFS on on UBI. Hello. 
Um, so Intel make SSDs. Do they? Uh, in, uh, Intel SSDs saner than other brands. Uh, would you yourself use an SSD? And if so, which brands would you be <coughs> more likely to use over other brands? Next. <laughs> I use an SSD. I use an Intel SSD. It's very fast. It, it works very nicely. I keep Git trees on it. It builds fast. I don't keep my mail store on it. Do you want me to answer more? <laughs> yeah, some of them are better than others. There is no fundamental reason why um, they have to be unreliable. The Intel ones, um, even if they weren't paying me, I would probably concede that they are amongst the best. Um, they do a fairly good job of making this stuff work right. Um, I realize you work in a totally different area. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, some of them are better than others. One problem, though, is you can't necessarily rely on that. I was um, in Boston a few weeks ago talking to old PC engineers, and they're using SD these days. And they'd actually managed to find some SD cards, which pass some um, sort of reliability and power file testing. They say, yay, this is brilliant. Let's have some more of these. The next batch, they're not so good. So they took them apart. Completely different hardware. Same manufacturer, model, everything, just a different batch. It's a black box, you cannot trust it. Um, from the uh, point of view from an end user who can't really know whether to trust the, that black box, can you recommend any utilities that can be used, say, to do write tests on a machine and send the results over a network and then randomly pull the power um, out to kind of... See Off the top of my head, no, but if you send me email, I can hook you up with, with that kind of thing. Yeah, certainly we have done that kind of power file testing on JFS2 and UBFS and on various sort of compact flash and other types of devices, and these scripts exist. Do any of the, uh, the flash devices do uh, soft detection, error correction, uh, Viterbi codes or something where you've got an analog signal coming out of the, the flash read? Um, if, the, uh, if the ones and the zeros start blurring into each other, Soft detection can let you sort it out with the error correction code, but only if you still have the analog signal. I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure how it would work. Um, bear in mind, if you go back to the MLC diagram, how do you tell the difference? I suppose you can tell that it's kind of on the borderline between a... Yeah, I do not know. Last question. I just wanted to ask, so I guess what I'm kind of getting, what I'm hearing from out of all of this as an end user, that um, having my operating system and apps run on an SSD so I can get fast execution, which I don't really care about because I can just reload that operating system and I don't really care if I lose it, um, is perfect and that's going to give me that extra boost, but storing my actual data and, and stuff, I should still be using a SATA IDE drive, is kind of what I'm hearing. That, yeah, yeah, I think so. No, no. That there are problems with all kinds of data storage. You've got, to do, you've got to do backups. You've got to check your backups work. But yeah, at this point, I would certainly suggest that you should be more careful about checking your backups work if you are storing your mail spool on any kind of flash device. And it's not entirely clear that you know, our file systems directly on flash are perfect either. But at least if they screw up, that's our fault and we can fix it. And that's all we have time for. Can we put our hands together for our speaker?